<laughs> Is my watch on? Yeah. Okay. Your mic's on mute though. How's that? Is that better? Mm -hmm. The good news is that when two or three are gathered together, God says what? He's in the midst of them. Yes. That's a congregation to me. Amen. 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 Thank you. I want to welcome our visitors. We have a potluck today. You came on the right side. You're all invited. I wish you each a blessed rest in Christ. Today we're studying lesson number 12 in the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. How many of you have a portal? We are studying lesson number 12. We're studying the last chapter in 2 Peter. In 2 Peter, chapter 3, Peter gives one of the most detailed biblical presentations on the end of the world in the entire Bible. Chapter 3 is specifically dealing with the topic of deception. And Peter is addressing an issue in his day that had to do with false teachers deceiving the people as to whether Jesus would ever come back, which suggests that they didn't believe that he was the Messiah. <coughs> they didn't even recognize his first trip to planet Earth. In chapter 2 of 2 Peter, verse 1, Peter uses a very interesting term in verse 1. It's destructive heresies. I'm warning you about teachers that are going to present to you destructive heresies. And then he explains to them that the danger of these destructive heresies is to confuse them and disconnect them from the truths that they have already been taught in regards to Jesus' second coming. And if they are deceived, the word destructive in the Greek language means your spiritual and eternal loss is a possibility. If you accept their destructive heresies. In verse 2 of chapter 2 of 2 Peter, Peter now predicts that many, how many is many? It's at least more than 50%, maybe higher, that many that he is writing to will accept these destructive heresies and in so doing, they will be maligning the Word of God. This issue about Jesus' second coming, not whether, but when, has a direct application to you and to me today. Amen. So let me ask you a question. Do you believe that God has always prepared human beings for Satan's deceptions? The question again was, has God prepared human beings? No. Has God always prepared you? Does God know the end from the beginning? Yes. yes. Does God know that something is going to happen before it happens? Yes. yes. That's called omniscience. 
in the history of this recorded world and of heaven. Let's throw heaven in here. Do you believe that God has always prepared people beginning in heaven? Did God prepare all of the population of heaven for Satan's rebellion? Yes or no? That God prepared Adam and Eve for the deception no. that they would face yes. in the Garden of Eden. No. Yes. yes. He told them of it, but he, he did tell them of it, but he didn't. He did tell them of it, so okay, he prepared them for it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. He's up. Yes, he's up. And heaven, there was no sin before Lucifer presented it. There was no sin. Yeah, there was no sin until Lucifer talked them into eating, the, taking the bite of the apple. God knew it. God knew it. But he, he allowed it. it. He allowed them to do that, though. He didn't disallow it. Where do we go from here? 50% say yes. <laughs> say yes. Let me ask the question. Let me ask the question in a different way. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10.13. Right. 1 Corinthians 10.13. And when you get there, say ready. And I'm going to read it to you as it's written in the original language. I'm going to quote it to you as it is written in the original language. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. If God has always prepared people to deal with Satan's deceptions, then my question is, is it a sin to be deceived? It's a sin to be 
I want for you folks to think this morning. Because what we're dealing with here is an issue that we sing about. When is Jesus coming back? And celebrating Jesus' second coming. How many of you want for Jesus to come back? I have news for you. Jesus wants to come back more than you want for him to come back. Is it a sin to be deceived? If 1 Corinthians 10.13 applies to heaven, and the population up there, at least a third of the population, that was deceived by Satan in the atmosphere of heaven, where all of you want to be taken to someday. In the atmosphere of heaven, Satan succeeded in deceiving a third of the population. There is no more important topic that you and I can be discussing this morning than deception. Is it a sin to be deceived? Let's go to Scripture and find out yeah. the answer to that. Is that a good idea? Yeah. Go to Scripture? <coughs> okay. Uh, who would like to read for us 1 Timothy chapter 2, 14? I suggest that all of you look it up. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. So, 
The word transgression in 1 Timothy 2.14 means iniquity describes my what? Inclination. The word sin describes someone that's messed up. Someone that's missed the mark. The mark is the standard. The Ten Commandments. Someone has missed the mark. That's what the word sin means in the original languages of Hebrew and Greek. Someone has missed the mark. It could be an ignorance, whatever. But the law has been violated. So someone's missed the mark. But the word transgression in 1 Timothy 2.14 is talking about knowingly, willingly, and deliberately doing something that is wrong. So when I am deceived, I have knowingly, willingly, and deliberately chosen to what? Do something wrong. We're talking grammar here, okay? I'm not inventing anything. The sin of deception means that... I'm going to use myself as an example. The sin of deception means that I have believed the lie of Satan. Which makes me a deceived person and immediately a partaker of Satan's deception, therefore a partner with Satan. Satan the deceiver, me the deceived. I have become one with Satan. And according to 1 Timothy 2.14, I have knowingly, willingly, and deliberately chosen to become deceived and therefore a partner with Satan. Again, we're just talking scripture here in the ground, okay? We're looking at the definition of these crucial words. Is that important? Yes. Can Satan... I'm the teacher. I'm supposed to ask questions. That's what I'm doing next time. Okay? But I'm going to give you scriptures to go to the answer to these questions. Can God bless that? Yes. Can Satan deceive anyone that believes in God? Thank you. We're just dealing with the issue of deception here. Okay? And the question is, can Satan deceive anyone that believes in God? Let's go to Scripture. What did we learn in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2? 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. The question is, can Satan deceive anyone that believes in God? The word believe is the same word in the Bible for faith. What is the definition of faith? My definition of faith is expecting God's word to do what God's word says it will do and then depending on God's word to do what God's word says it will do. That is faith. You have intellectually come to the conclusion that you expect that everything that God says, God will do. Now you push the enter button, which is faith, and now you choose to live the rest of your life by depending on God's Word to do exactly what God's Word says it will do. That's my definition of faith. So, let's, who would like to read 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Volunteer. Okay? Uh, Mary Jane. Therefore. What does the word therefore mean? Let me summarize something here. Okay. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 
that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. According to Scripture, <coughs> according to Scripture, can Satan deceive anyone that believes in God? Right? It's impossible. Question. What about Adam and Eve? We already covered that before you arrived. Okay. The question that we asked before you arrived was, has God prepared everyone that he's ever created to deal with Satan's deceptions before Satan deceived that person, beginning in heaven and beginning in the Garden of Eden? And we came to the conclusion from Scripture that 1 Corinthians 10, 13 applies to that. No temptation has or ever will overtake you that is not known to man because God is faithful and God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able to do it. And with the temptation, God will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to bear it. So that's a scriptural response to your question. We covered that already. Now. Another question. What? what? Another question. You have another question? I sure do. Jesus said, take heed that you be not deceived, which means there's a possibility. Right? If there was no possibility, he wouldn't have said that. So that means there's a possibility that a believer can be deceived. No, that's not the way. Are you talking about Matthew 24, 24? Mm -hmm. Let's read it. Let's go to Matthew 24, 24. What does that say? Pat, why don't you read it for us, brother? Okay. Matthew 24, 24. And 25. For there shall be, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Okay, that's just verse 25, so before verse 24. Um, 25 also, please. Well, 25 just said, Behold, I have told you before. Okay. If it's possible, if it's possible, even the elect will be deceived. But, since he has warned us, you and I have a choice whether we will be deceived or not. In other words, has God been unfair to the human race beginning with heaven? No. And with Adam and Eve, in no. not preparing them to deal with what they were going to face. That's the question that I asked at the beginning, before you arrived. And welcome, by the way. And we've established from Scripture that God has never allowed anyone to be deceived before preparing them for the deception that God knew was coming. And Jesus says in Matthew 24, 24, I'm telling you this because it's a fact that deceivers are going to come among you. And if you're not prepared and are listening attentively, you will be deceived, even the very elect. So he has what? He has what? He has prepared us. Now, if I choose to be deceived, that's a different matter. But the question is, is it possible for someone that believes in God, and again, the word believe is not intellectual awareness that God exists, but a faith experience, and I define my definition of faith, expecting God's Word to do exactly what God's Word says it will do, and then depending on it. If you trigger that, make that a reality in your life, is it possible for me, that description of a believer, to be deceived? No. Impossible. Now, let's take 1 Peter 5, verses 9 and 10. 1 Peter 5, 9 and 10. We're just reviewing what we've covered before because today we're studying chapter 3, which summarizes everything we've been studying for this quarter. 1 Peter chapter 5, 9 and 10. Who would like to volunteer to read that? Okay, Diana? Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. <coughs> but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So here's that word faith again. The question is whether I'm going to what? Exercise that faith. And if I exercise that faith, what does Peter tell us will be a result? 
<laughs> well, he uses the word suffer. Do we understand what the word suffer means? chapter 5. Do you know how Jesus prayed when he was on this earth? When I'm talking about the Lord's Prayer, okay? That's what he taught his disciples in Matthew 6. I'm talking about the way that Jesus felt he needed to pray. Okay? Hebrews chapter 5. When you're there, say ready and I'm going to read to you. Here we go. Beginning with verse 7. In the days of his flesh, is the word day is plural or singular? Plural. Right. Some people say that he didn't suffer until he was nailed to the cross. But here we have, the grammar tells us what? During his entire life, he suffered where? In the flesh. Why? Because Satan was beating him up physically every day with bats, you know, and throwing rocks. No, no, it's talking about what? The word flesh is talking about his nature. When the Bible writers talk about our physical body, they use the word body. The Greek word is soma, S-O-M-A. When it's speaking of my nature, it uses the word flesh. In Greek, it's sarx, S-A-R-X. Okay? Again, a little grammar here so we keep things straight. We know what we're talking about. And we don't expand all over the place. In the days of his nature, he offered up prayers and supplications. How? With loud crying and tears. To whom? To the one, uppercase, O, oh, speaking of God, able to what? Save him from what? Death. From death. And he was heard because of his piety, his sincerity. Eight, although he was the son of man, of God, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. For how long? When he was nailed to the cross or during his entire life? Days, Days plural. So what was he fighting? The nature that he had chosen to take on in order to ethically and legally save him. He was constantly fighting that. What is the word for iniquity? An inclination to do everything that is bad and illegal. In my case, I'm not talking about you. But that's the way I wake up every morning. Okay? So, 9, Hebrews 5. And having been made complete, matured, that's what the word perfect means, by the way. Okay? Look it up. Teleus. Same word that appears in Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore complete, mature. Even as your Father, which is in heaven, is complete and mature in this concept of what Jesus created here for us, for us which is righteousness. And having been made complete, perfect, he became to all those who what? Obey. Him, the source of what? Eternal salvation. That's the issue that we're dealing with here. Deception can only come if I choose to what? Be deceived by knowingly, willingly, and deliberately choosing to go against God's will. And now that becomes what? Transgression. The highest level of disobedience. That there is. Okay. Let's go a little. Let's go a little deeper into this topic about is it possible to deceive a believer? Let's go to Romans chapter six. Romans chapter six. Romans chapter six. When you get there, say ready, and I will read to you. I'm going to read because time is flying, and I want to cover some key points here. Romans chapter 6. We are exploring the idea, is it possible to be deceived if you believe in God? What does the word believe mean? It's the same word in the Bible for faith. 
And faith is deciding that you expect God's Word to do exactly what God's Word says it will do, and then depend on God's Word to do exactly what God's Word says it will do. That's the faith aspect as it applies to us. Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 10. For the death that Jesus died, He died to the sin problem. That's not a verb, that's an adjective. A condition, the sin condition.